Hello, everyone. Welcome to Twin Cities Zine Fest 2022. The Twin Cities are the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul of Minnesota. We acknowledge that we are on the unceded lands of the Dakota and Anishinaabe people. Tonight's event is our annual Zinester reading. We've been hosting virtual and in-person workshops happening this week, Tuesday, October 18th through Sunday, October 23rd. More information can be found at tczinefest.org or hclib.org under events. I want to send a few quick shout outs and thank yous to Jennifer Walker, who created this year's artwork, and to our partners at the Hennepin County Library here in Minnesota, who have helped make this fest and tonight's event happen, and to the Twin Cities Zine Fest volunteer organizers. I also want to thank the many other zinesters and fans who have joined us for this year's celebration. Tonight we have seven zinesters sharing their zines with you. Thank you to each of these folks who have helped create this zinester reading for Twin Cities Zine Fest 2022. On with the show. Hi, my name is Maddie Buck and I am from Minneapolis and I have a zine that I'm going to read for you today called Fundamental Right that I came up with after the Supreme Court released its decision overruling years and years of precedent um, in Roe v. Wade. Thank you. This morning, I woke up with a fundamental right under my nation's constitution. Tonight, I go to sleep without it by Maddie Buck. What does it feel like to have had more rights than your daughter, fewer rights than your mother, fewer rights than yourself, two days ago, six months ago, 15 years ago, and a legal system that smashes a half century of legal precedent? This. This is what it feels like. A myriad of stories fill the woods nearby, not just the wildlife and their familiar yet fascinating world. There are rumors of witches brewing potions, ghosts drifting in the winds, a lone scarecrow that strikes at anyone with its scythe. There's no telling what lurks in those trees. One of the oldest tales is of an isolated Queen Anne Victorian house, slumbering in the depths of the woods, and a stately skeleton that dances through the trees. The house was once owned by a renowned witch doctor named Tibia Paul Maxilia, who was revered for their practice in the skeletal system. Many boasted how, under their care, a shattered bone would heal in half the time than it would in a simple cast. Although the witch doctor likely retired well into their golden years, by the time your great-great-grandparents were children, it's speculated that the witch doctor left their practices to experiment in necromancy. Rumors as to why varied from reviving a lost loved one to finding a way to cheat death. Whatever the reason, the witch doctor had evidently succeeded, but not in the sense that one would hope. In truth, no one knows if the witch doctor is still alive, even if the house still showed signs of life. Smoke seeped from the mouths of the chimney at dusk as dull lights flickered the windows awake at night. Those who've dared stalk the house past sunset tell of a seven-foot-tall skeleton slipping out from the ambiguous structure to waltz through the woods. They seem to take delight at the sight of fear in others as the bony figures stalk the night, taking long strides while swaying their arms blissfully. They don't stay solely in the woods, though. The lanky skeleton had ventured into the hushed rows of town. Witnesses described the jovial corpse with stubby horns and dressed in a violet velvet tailored suit with a matching top hat that's too small for their cranium. This noticeable outfit earned them the nickname the Skeleton Gentleman. Some suspect the Skeleton Gentleman is the Wish Doctor's assistant brought to life with their gathered studies in necromancy. Others speculate that the skeleton gentleman is the witch doctor, transformed by sacrificing their humanity for eternal life. Or it's simply a strange anomaly born from the woods, seizing the building after the witch doctor's death. 
Many locals have their own thoughts on the skeleton gentleman's origins, but the truth lies behind the closed doors of that rickety old house. Those few who have ventured into the building when the skeleton gentleman isn't home came out screaming of a ghost haunting those ghastly walls. If the skeleton gentleman's either the assistant, the witch doctor, or a cryptid, then what of the fable ghost? Could it be the witch doctor spirit? Perhaps a summoned demon tasked to guard the place? Possibly a victim from the witch doctor's necromancy practices? Regardless of what or whom the ghost is, the restless spirits make sure that all intruders don't stay long. The peculiar relationship between the skeleton gentleman and the gritty house intrigued many passerbys, mostly those who foolishly want to test their courage or find a truth behind those decrepit doors. One such daring adventurer was a 12-year-old child who believed that the witch doctor was successful in raising the dead, with the skeleton gentleman being their first creation. But the undead being killed the witch doctor and now dwelled in the house. The child was so adamant about this story that their friends dared the youngsters to go into the cryptid three-story building and find the remains of the witch doctor. The bold kid took on the challenge, going to the lone house at night with their friends, but ventured into the building alone. The child barely heaved through the heavy cedar front doors into the vast foyer when they turned and saw the skeleton gentleman at the threshold of the dining room. They stood tall yet still, as if they were waiting for the invasive tyke. One step with the skeleton gentleman's elongated legs was enough to close the gap between themselves and the trembling child, who fumbled back out the door with a wail as loud as a goat before the monster could finish its stride. All I ask is that you keep writing unfinished poetry from the front lines is a zine I put together this past summer that is a compilation of obviously unfinished work that started moving into the uprising and has existed over the past couple years. Um, it is a result and in parts culmination of being in and around protest spaces and people and places who are honoring the politics of the uprising. So I'm going to read a few bits of that. One, I'm too busy getting arrested to write another poem, by which I mean sing karaoke, smoke a jay at the beach, the color of the snow when dusk washes over it. Rebecca once pointed out the pink camo to me in the fleet farm we considered stealing a generator from. I should do something with my life while I'm still 25 and young and beautiful. After all, not everything is life and death. Some things are just a steel chest plate, spray paint, a game of volleyball. Ian tells me they feel like a bowl of water with no even bottom, precarious and nearly flowing over. Then they hit their vape. I suppose it's all about balance, you know? This is the third poem in the scene. The security guards at the courthouse made them take a single tiger lily through the scanner. Two of the petal edges burnt to a crisp. They still place it in my open palm. It is not every day one gets to stand as witness, I suppose. I carefully cut the stem at an angle and lower it into a mason jar, desperate to keep anything alive for just a little longer. is the fifth poem in the scene. When in revolution does a name revert to being just that? When can I say the name of a city and have it mean where I reside and not where many have died? Or are names elastic, ever morphing? Perhaps it will never return, but evolve. And this is the sixth poem in the scene. And the final one I read to you. The Department of Safety helicopter is nearly colliding with the lunar eclipse. 
The looming red orb in the center of every sky is nearly blown back by the state helicopter. The state is looking for something cosmic, something so true they can put it into propaganda. The light cut in half. Absorbing only one part of night has no interest in disclosing, in revealing who she hovers above but still they search. They can't possibly let a beautiful night pass. Surely someone is doing crime under the cover of this moon. Real beauty has high stakes, which the people in the streets know, which is why they are in the streets craning their necks. The eclipse puts the moon at its closest point to the earth in its elliptical orbit. The blood moon does not have to describe what it does. No one has to describe blood to us. I see it in the way the red paint drips down the gas station as if we're asking it to flow. We tried the tides, jumping in lakes. Supposedly we're all in alignment, but another white kid opened fire this morning, so really who's to say? The glimmering astrologists open their palms to say, the lunar eclipse marks endings, energetic releases, by default, beginnings. I'm tired of endings, of judges, of the barrage of death correlated with summer. I'm consumed with the desire for new, hungering for beginnings, begetting beginnings, so much shiny newness to step through. So I will leave it there. Um, thank you so much for, time, for the time to view this submission and I hope you enjoyed the poetry. Hi. My name is Luis Blackaller, a.k.a. Cartoon Distortion. I am an artist from Mexico City. My pronouns are he, him, and I currently live in Los Angeles, where I make films and comics and prints and zines. You can find out more about my work and purchase my scenes at cartoondistortion.com. Today, I want to share with you a street photography scene series from Mexico City called Defectuoso. This publication contains no text except for the cover title. It is a collection of pictures that describe the story of my experience as a pedestrian in the city. There are no words to read, but there is a lot to look at, and I believe you will enjoy my commentary while I show you some of it. So, let's begin. Defectuoso, in a nutshell, is a serialized photography journal about life in the streets of Mexico City from 1985 to 2019. It is my own personal witness account. The Spanish word defectuoso used to be the nickname for Mexico City during the time I lived there, from 1969 to 2006. It is a wordplay derived from the abbreviation of the words Distrito Federal, Spanish for Federal District, the city's former official name. Today, Mexico City is officially known as CDMX. Defectuoso means defective in Spanish, in my opinion a fairly appropriate label for any city that grows to be that large, and a perfect title for a scene series about life in the streets of Mexico City. I publish a new scene every three or four months, and I plan to keep doing it for a while. Each scene is a limited edition of 100 copies, and I don't expect to reprint any of them again in the exact same format. The printing technique I use is unique to this edition. I chose the risograph printer because of two reasons. First, it naturally delivers a printed look and feel that reminds me of vintage newsprint, like all the magazines and comics and fotonovelas from my childhood that still populate many newsstands in almost every busy street corner and subway station in Mexico City. And second, the risograph printer is famously flexible at a low cost. It is perfect to experiment with custom ink color combinations. In this case, I have used scarlet and turquoise to produce a warm and vibrant palette that has given my color photography a new meaning. Just look at all those reds and greens and browns. As a filmmaker, the streets and their inhabitants are to me a source of raw material for the imagination. Each picture I take becomes a record of this raw material that helps me overcome the pitfalls of my own faulty memory. The pictures are not organized in chronological order. I use composition and my own personal narrative insight to arrange them in sequence and I keep all information about this process hidden, 
in purpose. I want the pictures to speak for themselves and to deliver a sense of mystery. All you know is what you are looking at, a moment frozen in time that took place recently somewhere in a city once called Defectuoso. I look for character in people, places and in situations. Each picture is a story of a moment that every observer gets to imagine. This is why there are no words in any of these scenes. You just get to look at the pictures one by one or together in sequence like in a silent comic that makes little sense. And if you feel like it, you can imagine what it must be like to walk the streets of Mexico City with me. I am very proud of these scenes and it has been a pleasure sharing them with you. Thank you. I appreciate your time and I hope you have enjoyed my work. And remember, you can get all of these scenes and more at cartoondistortion.com. Until next time, goodbye. Hello, my name is Kyle Tran Myrie. I use he, him, his pronouns. So people know me, it's usually by my stage name, which is Guante. Um, I'm a poet. And so I'll keep this short. I just wanted to share a little origin story and then do a quick reading. Um, but I got into making zines because as a poet, uh, really the bulk of the actual work that I do is performance and facilitation. And so I'm someone who's regularly up in front of like big audiences. And I just, I wanted to have something that was concrete, something real I could share, share with people, you know, to continue conversations, to just share additional resources. Because yeah, you know, people can, can buy my book or follow me online or whatever. But I think sharing a, an actual thing with someone like has a power that like follow me on Instagram doesn't really have. Um, and so just like for example, just to share some of the, the zines that I, that I share when I do events, um, this first one is called, How Do We Build a Culture of Consent? Um, I asked that question to advocates and survivors and students all over the country and kind of synthesized the answers into this, into this zine. Um, and you know, the whole idea of it is how do we go beyond the individual? Like it's important to practice consent as an individual, but how do we also build a broader culture? Um, similarly, the, this, this one is called The Art of Taking the L, and this one's actually a poem. Um, it's a poem I wrote about narrative and counter-narrative regarding masculinity. Um, and then aside from the poem, there's a bunch of like readings and resources and discussion questions, again, to kind of just continue the conversation. Um, this one is called Hope Does Not Glimmer, It Burns. And it's just a bunch of my favorite quotes and poems and songs about the, the concept of hope, especially in the context of like the climate crisis and the pandemic and fascism and on and on. The quotes are kind of have been guiding stars for me. So I just wanted to share them with other people. Um, a couple more just real quick. This one is called Perfection is a Parlor Trick. Actual magic is messy. Resources for emerging poets. And again, this is the thing I wish someone would have handed to me when I was 17 and just wanting to get involved in spoken word for the first time. Just a bunch of resources and um, entry points, doorways, stuff like that. Um, so much of my own career has been guided by mentors and just people, peers, sharing resources. So I wanted to keep that that thread going. And then the last one I'll share here, um, this is actually a zine that I helped write and design as part of the MP150 Collective here in Minneapolis. It's a combination of two previous zines. One of them is an abolition FAQs, Frequently Asked Questions, and one of them is just like 12 amazing quotes from 12 amazing articles about abolition for people who are maybe new to it and want to learn more. Um, it's really good stuff in there. Um, but yeah, the, the, the text uh, for all of those is available at my website, guante.info. Um, also PDFs for the eight page ones if you want to like print and fold your own using the classic eight page Z fold format. <laughs> um, but yeah, so rather than read from one of the zines, because all the text is already online, I figured I would just do something a little bit different, if that's okay, um, and share a short poem of mine that on some level is kind of about zines as a, as a practice, but also just pulls from my experience um, in the culture. Um, the idea that like, there's more than one way, you know, to get published, for example. There's more than one way to share information that is crucial to our communities. There's more than one way to tell our stories. Like this basic thread that there is more than one way. Uh, to me, that's, that's literal. And it's also something deeper about language, about counter-narrative, about like different ways of being in the world and on and on. So th this is called City of Heart. Steel to eat, 
Distribute banned critiques of the hoarders and exploiters via hand copied leaflet. Break a bully's face and laugh. It is so easy to do the right thing and find yourself on the wrong side of the law. Like the street we all know that separates the bad side of the city from the side they say you're not allowed on. Right or wrong is poetry. Legal or illegal is math an equation with one answer, black or white, like so much of their little world. To them, you are either inside or outside the cage, either citizen or non-citizen, male or female, I or not I. Streets run either north, south, or east, west. It's how they were built. It's how it's always been. So when you run, because you will run, remember, you love this city. And those who pursue you will only ever love its map, the straight lines and borders, the twin nightsticks of X axis and Y axis, climb up a wall, disappear. Hi, um, this is Mara Jarvis, and I'm going to be reading my zine, Getting My Fill. Um, just to let you know, it is not safe for work. So here we go. I touch myself all day. I hump your pillow, waiting for you to get off work. My fingers prune from my own juices until you finally get home and you take me and you fuck me, and you film me. And this zine was originally printed for the 2020 Dear Diary Zine Fest, but I edited it and reprinted it, and now it's Resograph printed in fluorescent pink. Thanks. Hello everyone, this is Drew with Lucinda Productions. Um, here with Twin City Zine Fest, and I'm gonna be doing a reading for you. Um, so what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be reading some poems from uh, Broken Galaxies Magazine Volume 1, which is a uh, sci-fi horror fantasy zine series that we publish here. And we just finished Volume 1, which consists of four issues, and they're all available in our shop. So I'm not going to read everything for you, but I'm just going to read a little bit. There's some poetry kind of scattered throughout the run that I wrote, and um, I'm going to start with issue number one. So as you can see, uh, there's each zine has uh, different contributors, and then there's uh, short stories, artwork, uh, comic strips. Yeah, all kinds of neat goodies in here. So this is a haiku I wrote from issue number one. A lone magician conjures broken messages from another realm. So it's just like a little haiku with a drawing, and then uh, actually this I issue ends with another haiku and uh, image. A candle ignites free from any source of heat, a new disturbance. Okay, so next one. Uh, issue number two, I actually had a couple full-length poems that I wrote in this one. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and read just uh, one of them for you. Uh, let's go with the shorter one. This one's called Four Eyes and a Focal Point. Prowling without the cover of even a fading shadow, the unbroken fix tightly locked to a trailing stare, fooling the untamed mind with friendly smiles and seemingly innocent glances, an unstable creature to those paying notice. All the while, another threat lurks in the distance, an observer, aware of the ill intent, behind harmless gazing, 
someone unafraid to brand, banish niceties in exchange for justice. Obvious flaws, too easily overlooked, not released from judgment from those who keep watch. Yeah, and then, uh, actually, I really like this one uh, The at the end of issue two. So I'm going to go ahead and read that one for you. It's got a drawing. Microverses evolve. Waters fasten between particles as the space expands past knowledge. A shadow swimming through entanglements, growing upwards from a rough bottom. Exploration instantly igniting. Motions and perception, souls peering outward, shrouded amongst the creeping greenery. Stillness flowed seamlessly into currents, limbs rapidly move just to remain in place. Well, that's about all I got for you today, but I uh, hope you're enjoying the fest and um, you can pick up one through four of Broken Galaxies uh, in our shop you can find it in our bio and our instagram page and beyond that i appreciate everyone for listening thank you twin city zine fest for having us and have a great night